Welcome everybody, we're just spending some time working on uh, Osuki Tea. If you haven't been able to catch these streams, I've pretty much been working on this language and my other language that I started off in high school. And I'm still pretty proud of it, I just needed some work. But today, we are focusing on Osuki Tea, which I need to adjust this. Osu -i -i. So, just as a quick recap, um, Osugi Tri was meant to be a very non concatenative language with, uh, with subject agreement marked by uh, apophony. So, a front, a front vowel, a, uh, or, or a back vowel, which I mark with. H with the H archiphoneme for E, A, uh, U, and the M archiphoneme for A, 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 O. And then some vowel mutation can happen because of R's and R in the proto language. So, when we look at the morphology page, you can see very clearly how that works. Um, so, as is this the one with the clefting? Yes, this is the one with the clefting. Um, one of the big things, yeah, so one of the big things is that I wanted there to be a lot of clefting, a lot of non, quote unquote, non-configurationality, um, which we're gonna work on today. Um, so, that's why I have object agreement and um, case marking. Uh, but yeah, big goals. Ah, big goals actually, right? Analogy, heavy analogy, Cornish or Welsh style clefting, and no grammatical number shown in uh. No grammatical number shown in verb. I, I should change that. Or subject. No grammatical number for subject market. So, that's pretty much what we're going to work on today is syntax and how things work. In, in previous streams, we, um... We ended up figuring out that the proto lang might have a relative clause structure, something like this. So, underneath the blue house that fell would be constructed as underneath that fell house blew the. So, it's. It, it's something. <laughs> it. It's very un-English, which I like a lot. Satin, one of the regular attendees of this stream, pretty much just said, Hey, here you go. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how we got this. Um, and I did, I did pick up a book, um, or I ordered a book on syntax, like theoretical syntax and stuff, so... We will, we will learn more about how to do things. Um, but for right now, this is just my, these are just the seedlings of what might become something more intense. So before we, um, before in other streams, we had kind of faced this, this deal. I'm gonna just delete that because that's all sorts of out of date. Hello, Maitsu. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for checking in. That's, it's great. It's great to see new people. Um. It's, 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 I'm just learning. I'm using this as an opportunity to learn 
and get better. So can't really can't really do much more. Um so in previous streams we ended up facing something like this. Where it is kind of it's non-configurational. The modern syntax is non-configurational. But there's just a whole bunch of like caveats with that. Um I don't quite remember. I think I think OVS came from like OVS here came from clefting. So like take a sentence like uh the dog sat on the rock. So the dog sat on the rock becomes is it is the rock that the dog sat on um so that whole idea of object fronting um but with that with this relative clause structure that would that would look a bit different so, the prep, the preposition relative, the relative. So we might be looking at something like on that is that is the dog. On that is the dog sat rock the In <laughs> where we might be looking at something I don't think it has to be ship I don't think it has to be a relative clause for the object to front but just since and this is my anglophone coming out since that what since that's what we do in english that's what came to me um there are there are ways to cleft there are ways to cleft that don't involve relative clauses yeah in the in the celtic languages they just do it so it might be Uh, so take the dog sat on the rock. So Maitsu, you, you're, you're like, uh, we're like a step ahead of you. So I'll get into that in a second, but we have a way to handle topicalization, which I think would be the big function, like the big thing that would cause clefting. Um, yeah, yeah, I might too. Uh, yeah, we have, we have ways to do it. We have ways to do it. And I'm very, very, very excited for it. Um, so if we're just doing the dog sat on the rock, we can do rock. dog sat so on the rock the dog sat hey majahadra uh, be aware that english does pied piping intriguing what does that mean what what does pied piping mean um while I'm waiting for a response, I'm gonna go into this case system that we have for uh Ma Maitsu. So we so I can explain quick what I'm doing with topicalization. So we have uh one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine cases. Two of them are genitives. 
what's the difference between the genitive, the two genitives? Well, the first genitive uh, speaks about or is used for possession, description, or participation. Um, this one can also function as an essive, aka something to the effect of being an X. Oh, is that what Pied Piping is, Shift? The... She bought, uh, she bought which house becomes Pied Piped. It's Pied Piped. Love that. That's fantastic. Um, so the first genitive is used for possession, description, participation, and description. Something to the effect of being an X. So for an example, dog. Uh, oh, what was, what was the example I used last night? What was the, ex I, I was talking with Sotten last night. Oh, what was, uh, it was something to the effect of dog, uh, child. Gen, was it Gen 1 that I used or Gen 2? Yeah, it was Gen 2. No, I did use Gen 1. I guess it's just understood as... You can also split... <laughs> Pied Piping can also split phrase phrases? PP phrase phrases? <laughs> yeah, it was Gen 1. We're just gonna skip over that. Dog. But given context, given proper context, dog, child, genitive 1 can also mean a puppy. Because of that figure. The dog child gen 2 was Oh, uh, which one was which one was the puppy and which one was the child's dog? I feel like um gen 2 because it was topicalization, like talking the putting the child as the topic made it a possessor. Or made it understood as a possessor? I may be totally incorrect on that one. I may be incorrect about my own language. It's... Well, anyway. This, this first genitive handles... Handles possession, description, and participation. Hmm, then if if uh if genitive two gen two has the acid function Hmm Genitive two has the acid function So that Whoo that's interesting How would that work with the topicalization? Would that just mean that <laughs> Sutton knows more about my language than I do? Woo! Um, I guess it's just the idea of like the fa <laughs> yeah that that was exactly it actually. Um, so so. Last night, while I was on the call with Sotten, uh, we ended up figuring out a way to just demolish a sense of, the sense of different, 
different parts of speech. So, <laughs> there's no such thing as noun versus verb. And we ended up figuring out a way to destroy the differentiation between noun and adjective, or noun verb and adjective. So, the genitive, the second genitive would be used to make an adjective out of a noun. Um, I feel like that would have the man like who want, yeah, the man like who hunts ducks. The man like who's been slapped by cats. I love that. Um, but using this essiv, we can derive adjectives from nouns, which can be very like confusing. And it, so, <laughs> there's just a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things that are going to uh, affect everything. So, let's, let me start from the beginning, or let me start from a point where, a point that makes sense. So, there are nine cases. Nominative, accusative, dative, two genitives, locative, ablative, allative, instrumental. Everything behaves the way it normally does. And the genitive, the two different genitives function on, you use different functions of just like a normal genitive. Where the first genitive is possession, description, and participation. And the second genitive, the second genitive is used for origin, reference, topicalization, and now description, or a, a different sense of description. Ah, yeah, let's just shove that. Um, so yeah, description. Um, locative, ablative, allative are all pretty normal. They're all pretty normal. Um, the instrumental does, um, I talked about this with Satin last night as well. The instrumental does a little bit of weirdness. Um, it functions as an instrumental. And I didn't know that there were that there was a whole different meaning that can be convey, conveyed by an instrumental as well as an entirely different case. I wasn't given the name of the other case, but the other case was um the other case was like, "Hey, how did you get here? By means of X." So it's the instrumental case is used with like hey how did you cut that i used a knife um and how did you get here how did you as well as how did you get here i used a car or another fun one we used um another fun example that we figured out was i ate by means of hunting deer So, this, these case markers are going to do all sorts of clefting. The, the, they're going to be the reason for clefting. Um, it's it's going to be... They, uh, Sotin, they sound similar, but some languages are very strict on distinction. Methodive. Methodive. That's a fun name. Also, Mitsu. 
uh, Maitsu, could you explain Izafe? I feel like I feel like I remember that from uh, from Arabic. It's something like with the it's a it's an accusative esque sort of thing, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, ship. That does sound like a committative, but I don't I don't know, because apparently they are different. <laughs> Instructive is the name that would be given from what has been found. Yeah, yeah. The commendative is normally just bunched in with the within with the instrumental, which is hold up. I ended up figuring out that the first genitive would have that. Well, no, would it? Does it make sense if I already have an instrumental? I could just do the instrumental committative. Bam. And instructive. Izafe is a person thing that is a person. A Persian thing. It's a genitive-esque connecting word. That's interesting. I have I'll have to read up on that. Um But yes, so to finally get along to the basic basic idea, a lot of these cases are gonna be the reason for clefting. A re the reason why we can get away with clefting. And this person marking is how we're going to be able to keep the clefting. Um, so, as you can see, in in the singular, in all of these declensions, is generally not very role marking. It doesn't like to do stuff. It doesn't like to do role marking. Um, in the plural for the voiced declension and the palatal declension, yes, it likes to do it likes to do role marking but it's not very common and in fact i can see just this falling out of use um but we um i'm not sure how i want to do that um so that's that's basically cases they came from um, nominative, accusative, and dative all came from a very old case system that is most likely pre-proto, and everything else came after. So, so that's our genitive system, or genitive system, our noun case system. Um, person marking is done by apophony, so close vowel or mid vowel e a u versus a a o um yeah nothing really there Sotten. okay hear hear me out call it the adverbial case disconnected from locative use Oh, Sotten. <laughs> um, but yeah, person marking is done by apophony. By uh, and I and I usually write archiphonemes because it's just easier to me. Easier to me. Um, but here's here's our tense system. My last stream. I I um. My last stream, I had a little bit of a uh, excited spell because of how beautiful this is. This is amazing to me because the way it works, the way it evolved is it evolved from a simple past-non-past -past system with an imperfective-perfective distinction. 
So, the old perfective got mutated into a direct evidential marker. What do you mean adverbs are just a case? Love that. Uh, the perfective mutates into a direct past, evidential. And soon, soon after that, a new perfective auxiliary comes into use. Now this perfective auxiliary came into use with both the present and the indirect past. So, you had that current meaning of right now I am doing X. Right now I do X and I am continuing to do X, which would have been represented by that present perfective. Now that meaning of I am continuing to do X got reinterpreted as a future, which means the future tense is the assumed tense in all circumstances. And I love it. It's it I, I kind of took inspiration from English, obviously, because of our unmarked I took inspiration from English and then flipped it on its head. You'll find I do that a lot. I've done that with voiceless vowels. I did that with the phonology of the whole heavily aspirated thing um but i took i took the idea from english where the unmarked form is the habitual and flipped that on its head for also and used the unmarked form of the verb as the future because it is innately perfective or imperfective um that's that who that's my absolute favorite aspect currently um i also love that they become infixes in <laughs> these become infixes so in all circumstances the uh, the uh, other than other than when it ends in a vowel uh, becomes an infix and what used to be rrr became an infix. And in coda position, rrr caused vowel coloring or R coloring. So vowels like e, uh, e and u became e and o. So ir became er, ur became or, and er became ar, and or became or. So that's why that's how we get up that's how we get low vowels in the direct past for um the mid vowel conjugation. Um I don't think there's very much to I don't think there's very much left to talk about for what we have so far. Um So just to just to summarize, cases, big boy cases, we use, we're going to use a lot of those for clefting. Um, tenses with an assumed future tense. And uh, person marking done by vowel apophony. And all of this, uh, so this role marking stuff is done to facilitate clefting which in the next video we're gonna cover so youtube come on back if you want to uh if you want to see how that plays out um yeah that's all for this one